Hello, my name is Nathan Taggart. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, and I'm here with Dr. Joe Duraney and Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, who are congenital cardiovascular surgeons at Mayo Clinic. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, but today we're going to be talking about atrioventricular canal defects, or AV canal defects, also known as atrial ventricular septal defects. Um, Elizabeth, uh, so there are a lot of different types of AV canal defects. Can you uh, give us an overview of, of the different types? Certainly, yes, there are a number of types, and so we'll go over the first one here is complete atrioventricular septal defect, or as you said, canal defect, it's also called. And this animation shows the anatomy, so the right atrium there, on the blue side are deoxygenated right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And you'll see there's a big hole in the middle where there should be tissue. So there's a large ventricular septal defect below and an atrial septal defect above. And the flow of the blood goes left to right instead of staying on its proper side. So that's the complete atrial ventricular septal defect. And then this is partial atrial ventricular septal defect. Again, we'll go through the anatomy, right atrium, right uh, left atrium. And you can see that there's now just a atrial septal defect and below is intact and the blood goes from the left atrium to the right atrium. And then there is on the left side or what uh, can be called a mitral valve, there's a leak there usually. But there is a whole spectrum here and so we saw on the far left there the complete where there's a, a hole above and below and those two valves are one big valve. And then on the far right what's called partial where below in the ventricular area that's intact and you have two separate valves, a mitral and a, a tricuspid valve and the hole is above in the atrial level. Um, about three quarters are complete canals and about a quarter are partial and then there's some of these ones that are in between that are um, more unusual. In general, these are um, repaired when they're done electively and the patient's doing well. The complete canals are usually about three to six months, whereas those partial uh, atrial ventricular septal defects, which is more like an atrial septal defect in terms of their clinical path, is between one and four years of age. And what are some of the surgical techniques, uh, or what's the surgical approach when you're considering repairing these? What does that involve? Well, there are two main techniques for the uh, canals, and you can see on one of those images, there's a patch um, above and below the valve. So this is called a two patch or a double patch repair. And the second uh, main type of technique for the, the, these are the complete canals, is what's called a modified single patch. And what you'll notice is there's one patch and that um, those valves now are not quite in the same straight line or plane, uh, but those are kind of two of the main techniques for the complete um, atrial ventricular septal defects. Oh, thanks. Now, Joe, the Mayo Clinic has a long history of repairing AV septal defects. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that's evolved into the, uh, the, the current practice? Sure, so there's a rich history of, of AV canal uh, anatomy and surgery here at Mayo. And Dr. Rostelli, uh, who is the one actually that still to this day gets the credit for the classification that's used universally all around the world, uh, really focused on the complete AV canal defect, but that classification really helped determine what kind of a technique was going to be used. And in the earliest days, it was just one patch that actually straddled both the pumping chambers and the receiving chambers, and that's evolved into two separate patches then a modified modified single patch technique. So it's it's evolved over, over recent years. The results are very, very good. Uh, the incisions have also evolved. Uh, I mean, in an infant, we still do sort of a standard sternotomy incision for the complete AV canal. But once they get older with the partial AV canals, we can do them through uh, sort of a smaller, a hemi sternotomy incision. And the partial AV canals actually may not even get recognized until the teenage years. And once the patient gets uh, you know, big enough, then there's the robotic approach, which is even less invasive than, uh, than a sternotomy approach. So the incisions continue to evolve. Uh, the, the operations have stood the test of time. The risk of surgery is low and the long-term outlook is, is actually quite favorable. We'll start talking about some of the potential needs for reoperation in the future. But uh, in general, it's an anomaly with, with a good outcome. Yeah, and, and along those lines about reoperation, uh, certainly uh, a lot of patients will just need one operation and they're done. 
some of them will need a, a second uh, operation. Elizabeth, can you tell us a little bit about that and what sort of patients might be looking at more than one operation in their lifetime? That's a great question. So the complete AV canals in general, it's about a quarter of the patients over 15 years or so will need a reoperation, and the partial canals is less, it's more like 15%. It depends on a number of factors, including the age at the first repair, how small the valve was, how um, difficult the repair was, um, but they should be aware that there could be a need for a reoperation. The most common uh, need for reoperation is that left-sided valve or the mitral valve that tends to leak over time. Um, and then the second most common um, cause for reoperation would be what's called the outflow trap, but the area kind of below the aorta, which can get narrowed. So those are the two kind of main reasons. At Mayo, we're very experienced with valve repair, so this is something that we see a lot and we do a lot. Um, we do our best when it is repairable, and we think we can get a durable long-term repair on the valve to uh, repair it and leave the patient with their own valve as opposed to replacing it. There are times when we do need to replace it. But I would say also in particular, those young, very young neonates where where the, maybe the valve was quite small when the initial repair was done. Those are kind of patients that might be at more risk for needing surgery down the line. Thank you. Now, some, uh, some of our patients who have AV canal defect also have other, other things going on. Uh, for example, Down syndrome, very common um, to have AV canal defects. Uh, Joe, can you tell us how that affects the treatment and the timing of of surgical repair. Yes, so Down syndrome is, is not uncommon with a, a variety of congenital heart defects, but AV canal is probably one where it, we see it more commonly than we would like. Um, I think that the, the biggest implication for Down syndrome is that we tend to do surgery earlier with Down syndrome, and not just for AV canal, but any of the defects. And part of the reason is, is the, the consequence of the abnormality results in elevated blood pressure in the lungs. And for reasons which are not exactly clear with Down syndrome, that elevated blood pressure in the lungs tends to be accelerated and it tends to be more difficult to reverse after the, after the anomaly is repaired. And so we really try to do it before six months of age and sometimes it's closer to three months of age you know, when we do it. But the outlook still is actually quite favorable. Uh, and in some situations, I think at least in our, our personal experience, repair of the defect in Downs is sometimes a little bit easier than, uh, than in the non-Downs child. The ICU care can be a little more challenging for the ICU doctors. They tend to have more difficult times clearing their secretions and uh, you know, their airways tend to be a little more reactive and they're a little more, you know, bedside work for the nursing staff and the ICU staff. But once you get over that, uh, the, the outlook is actually quite favorable. And a number of years ago, we looked at um, the late results of patients with Down syndrome. I actually did myself personally, and I was quite impressed with the functionality of many of these patients. Many of them were either in school or they were working or they were married. It was really quite impressive how optimistic it is, uh, even in the setting of Down syndrome. And so for, I think the message for parents here is to not be overly discouraged about the combination of the defect with the Down syndrome. The, the outlook is still quite promising and, uh, and I think we should all be really very positive about it. I was, it was really eye-opening, I think, to see how good the quality of life is for, for so many of those patients down the road. Yeah, that's great. Um, as a parent, uh, one of the scariest things I can imagine is bringing my child to the hospital for open heart surgery. And one of the questions we get a lot as cardiologists before surgery is, what's it gonna look like? Uh, how long are they gonna be in the hospital? What's the chance they're gonna survive? Can you and share a little bit about that, Elizabeth? Yeah, well, having expectations and talking through them, I think is very helpful for everyone involved. And obviously it's a scary time, but um, our staff is also very used to helping our families through that time. So I think that is a very supportive environment for that. Um, as far as what to expect, um, it does depend on the patient. So if you 
for, for example, had like a six-month-old who was coming in for an elective repair and otherwise was relatively healthy, they might stay in the ICU for a, f a couple of days and then be out of the hospital in five to seven days. Um, and that would kind of be one more standard. Now, a neonate, a, a young, real young baby um, who is maybe having failure to thrive or having struggles in other ways you would expect would take a longer time and they can have issues with eating or other things that might not be related to their heart um, after their heart surgery. And then on the other end of the spectrum would be maybe an adult where this is found much later and if they get you know a robotic approach or even a sternotomy, those patients can tend to um, really get out of the ICU quite quickly and go home quite quickly. Um, so I think there is a spectrum, but that kind of gives families an idea. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Stevens. Thank you, Dr. Duraney. It's been great. Thank you as well for joining us on this uh, brief conversation about AV canal defects.